Hey everybody, uh, welcome in. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to go over the fun part, uh, which is to go over uh, some of our housekeeping, just to allow some time for more people to flow in. And once we have a uh, critical mass, we could go ahead and get started with the presentations. So uh, webinar is being recorded. Um, so if you happen to miss parts, you need to rewind, or if you have a colleague that wanted to attend, um, we'll send the recording of the presentation slides and uh, well, we'll send the presentation slides and recording to the email that you registered. Um, we'll also have the recording uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, I also want to use this as a way to plug our YouTube channel. Uh, just type in the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans in that search bar, click subscribe. Uh, all of our webinars and uh, other pieces of really interesting content live there, so I strongly encourage you to subscribe. Again, that's the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans uh, on YouTube. Uh, the webinar is set for an hour, but the presentations will be around like 40, uh, 40 to 45 minutes. Um, and we'll use the remainder of the time for moderated Q&A. Um, you will see a questions tab to ask your questions. You're welcome to ask your question anytime throughout the webinar. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, we'll return back to it once that uh, Q&A session opens up. Uh, chat is disabled, so if you really want to interact with our presenters, Ask any, you know, ask any questions or comments, just go ahead and, again, use that questions tab uh, just to practice using it. Um, for those who are in here, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us your name, uh, position within your organization, and its location. Um, so it looks like we're ready to get started here. So uh, I'll go ahead and open us up. So again, welcome everybody. This is our third webinar for Elevating the Voices of Homeless Veterans series. It's our 2024 webinar series. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this project, it started back in 2021, uh, thanks to the Home Depot Foundation, and we've been doing webinars ever since. Um, so this series, we're discussing uh, how to change the narrative on homelessness and how we can uh, empower homeless veterans in the electoral space. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, Today, we'll be covering ground on some useful practices on how we can work to ensure homeless veterans can exercise their right to vote uh, in elections. In 2020, research conducted by the University of Southern California uh, found that as few as one of every 10 uh, person experiencing homelessness votes in a general election year. As we know, homeless people face a wide variety of systemic challenges that prevent them from accessing crucial services and resources. And this isn't any different in the electoral space. You know, lack of information, identification, and transportation are just a couple or just a few examples of what voters need to comfortably exercise their rights. But these are common barriers for those experiencing homelessness. Each election year presents an opportunity to take another step forward on critical issues like homelessness, affordable housing, and the availability of support services. And this past year alone, we've seen the stakes grow incredibly high. Housing costs increase, supply dwindling, and the push to criminalize homelessness spreads. So we need everyone working together to use their voice and influence to create a safe future for those struggling with homelessness. And most importantly, we need to support those experiencing homelessness to vote on the issues that greatly affect them. Nonprofit organizations can make a really, really big impact on organizing their constituents and enhancing their ability to exercise the right to vote. Although nonprofit 501c3 organizations can't formally involve themselves in politics, uh, they can still educate, register voters, and also facilitate the means to get to the polls. Uh, so today we'll discuss various practices. Nonprofits can help homeless veterans overcome disenfranchisement and cast their ballot in this crucial election year and many more to come. So today we have three wonderful presenters. Uh, we are starting off with uh, Francis Colombo Ngoy, the National Campaign Director at the National Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, Lauren Kunis, the Chief Executive Officer of Vote Riders, and Celia Moreno, the uh, Social Impact Lead at the LIFT. Uh, again, uh, we'll do presentations first and then open up for Q&A. Uh, I'm going to go off camera, off mic, and I'll let Francis start us off. Sure. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Francis Kalomongo, as mentioned. I'm humbled to be here with you today, and also uh, it's an honor to share stage with amazing speaker who are coming right after me. Uh, for me, I'm here because I believe housing is both a human right and also a civil right, and nobody should be um, 
in the richest country in the world shouldn't be people be sleeping in the street. And uh, we cannot uh, hide or push people away, displace people away and think we're gonna solve homelessness. The only way for us to solve homelessness is if we all engage and participate. And the greatest part of that, we gotta make sure that people's right to vote is protected because it's their right to vote. It's critical that we ensure that people's rights are protected at, like, at all costs. It's necessary, it's necessary that people who are disfranchised the most must supposed to be the center stage and make sure they, their voices are being heard. And today I'll just go through over some tips that you can use to, uh, to engage voters who are experiencing homelessness, some barriers that are faced in both registrations and also like into voting as well. And what the uh, city organizations as nonprofits, as advocates we can do to make sure that people get to the ballot, not only register. So I'll just go through the slides and then when I have some questions later on, uh, we can please go to the next day, to the next uh, slide. Thank you very much. Uh, the principal question here is, can people who are unhoused vote? Yes, they can. Uh, the cornerstone of our democracy uh, is that people need to be involved and participate in democracy, in voting. And voting is one of the most powerful ways to express how you wish uh, your committee, uh, your uh, representative to act or vote based on your interests, right? So it's very critical that we ensure that people are unhoused know that yes, like even though we make sure we want to make sure that people are housed because housing is a human right uh, and health is a human right is very critical that voting is a human right is very important that we understand that irrespective of that even if you have no home you can still vote because for the way to actually ensure that your voice is being heard that you need housing is be able to participate in democracy and that's what we are here for today and to ensure that happens historically people of color and people who are from low-income communities are the people mostly disfranchised from voting and they're the lowest number of voters who turn out. And the reason for that is not by choice, sometimes it's also because of systematic barriers that are placed in place, are put in place throughout the country, state after state. And it's our job as advocates and people who care for our, for our, our brothers and sisters to ensure that their rights are protected because it's something that uh, people have been trying to uh, remove from people who wanna vote as well. So we gotta ensure that we inform people I'm not sure that we know that they actually understand that uh, they are they're able to vote because their vote is very critical. Sometimes in modern days, we are very discouraged, like, yeah, my vote doesn't matter. No, every vote does count. And that's why it's very critical that the people who are affected the most are like, at the, like actually like at the center stage to ensure that they are voting as well. Uh, we can please go to the next stage, to the next uh, slide. Yeah, so here I'm just gonna provide some uh, uh, voter registration tips that we can use. Uh, so you can make registration uh, like part of your intake for those who work in shelters, work on, uh, for those who work in, on services that provide services to people experiencing homelessness. It's something that you can do. As a city organization, yes, you cannot lobby, uh, you cannot endorse a specific candidate, you cannot endorse a specific, par uh, a specific party, but you can actually for sure uh, like encourage people to vote. And that's part of the thing that you can do uh, you can do that during the intake process or the, uh, the also like the exit interview. You can also do that as well. That's part of you're allowed to do with your status uh, like, like as a C3. Uh, you can put up signs announcing that people can register here. But you got to keep in mind that some states are required that you actually work with the, uh, the, the city clerk. Uh, you work with the count, like the Board of Elections to make sure that you register with them to ensure that they provide you the necessary uh, training that you need to make sure you can actually order a proper registration drive and actually allow you to actually receive a vote. Some states do not require that. You can actually start on your own. But just keep in mind that you gotta look with your specific local laws and how we relate to voting and, and, and registrations. And also you can have like an outreach. Uh, you can have the workers who work with the community also go and actually get people to register to vote with uh, uh, filler forms. They can fill out those even like in person or virtually like online, they can fill those out. You can feel for some, like people can fill out those forms but you gotta make sure that the people sign it. Um, like you can, you, you cannot sign for somebody else uh, the voting, uh, 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 like uh, uh, the forms that they are going to vote with. So it's very critical that you you, uh, you make sure that uh, those who are registered to vote, uh, their, their signature is the one is on there, not your own. It's very critical. 
Uh, you can also ask your uh, clients or, or people who you work with, people with experience, to be on as well, uh, to be like on a board where they can actually get out as well to actually encourage other people to board because sometimes we connect people more with people we can identify with. So it's very critical. We all, like even the people we put out to go like doing the outreach, we gotta make sure it's very diverse and people can connect with them. It's very critical that they understand like, okay, this person means well for me. So it's very critical to do that. Uh, you can like also let your clients uh, use your agency as a mailing uh, the mailing address. As you know, when it comes to addresses and voting registrations, people who are being displaced left and right, as you can see throughout the country, uh, the camp resolution in California, we have seen even in DC, people are, are being displaced left and right. In the process, they are losing IDs, they are losing uh, the stable place where they are they call home. So we're gonna make sure that uh, they can use your agency as a mailing address. They can fill out the ballot or the absentee ballot, or they can actually like you use it as an example. So you are in your right to allow people to use your address as a voting place. So don't be discouraged about that. We actually encourage that intakes, uh, the agencies that provide services, people are connected with people with experience are the most uh, the driver of the process because they view, already do trust with the, uh, uh, with the community. That's very critical to, uh, to actually have because research has shown that people who are encouraged to vote by nonprofit organizations, organizations that services them, they are more likely to vote than not. So that's, that's an important fact to know. You can please go to the next slide. Thank you so much. And again, uh, we know barriers are being placed even right now, barriers are being uh, left and right in every state and every, like across the country. And the reason why we are actually engaged in this discussion today and, and how we can make sure that people who are differentiated, the people voices are being heard on, or like on the ballot where they can express how they wish to be led by people. So one of the big areas people have faced is lack of ID, as I said, through the process of being displaced, they're having like unstable housing. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with people like uh, with the ID registration. Some of them are getting lost in the process because sometimes people's property are being taken away in the process of being displaced. So it's very human act, but IDs are being lost in that process. So sometimes we find people in the street having difficulties having uh, the ID necessary to actually vote. So that's one of the barriers that they face. Sometimes it's difficulty of keeping the uh, registration current, meaning that the address keep changing uh, from day to day. Sometimes it's hard to keep the registration current. So it's always important to check as a nonprofit organization, you're working with those clients and they wanna vote, make sure you make sure like you keep that registration current for them as well. And sometimes it's a lack of understanding from, from the officials actually leading it. Sometimes people who work in the election, they don't understand that people who are on house can still vote and it's in specific areas. So it's very important that you are informed and also you inform the people you're working with, uh, the unhoused population that this is how you can vote, it's your right to vote. So it's very critical that they know that uh, sometimes even the people working in the poll, they may actually tell them like, oh, you cannot vote. Like actually they should know that, yes, I can vote. It's still my right to vote, it's very critical. Sometimes it's lack of access. You know, access means many facets, right? Lack of internet, lack of access to the resources or material information knowing when the polls are, when the registration forms can be uh, received from, and sometimes it's uh, transportation. So having, uh, whenever you do a drive, you provide transportation for them is very critical because sometimes people, the drives are so far away, the registration are far away, someone can get discouraged, but if you provide them access to those uh, resources, they're more likely to vote than not. And sometimes people, you know, uh, discouraged by the system, you know, the system has failed them many, many years. And sometimes, you know, trauma comes into play and now people are more in survival mode. The last thing they're thinking about is voting because they said, I vote before it never happened, like nothing changes. But it's our job to encourage people said, your voice is the most powerful thing you have. You can actually direct the direction of the thing. So it's very critical that people are informed about their voting, but still voting is to their choice, but we are most always encouraging people to vote because participation is the greatest way of, of protest. That's very critical. And sometimes discrimination, as we know, a country, uh, United States, uh, you know, as a history of discrimination, uh, even uh, voter suppression happening all over the states right now. Uh, uh, laws are being created to disfranchise people from voting. That's very important that we ensure that uh, those practices are not in our, like even our own nonprofit organization, whenever we organize anything to do with driving, with uh, uh, people getting to vote, we have to ensure that uh, in our practices, we are very uh, racial equity minded and very centered on the people we serve in the community that we are not dis, uh, disfranchising anybody in the process. Employment, so those who can who, like, who have jobs, sometimes like someone can decide like, should I go to work or should I go vote? Sometimes like those people work hourly, you know, like, like that's the hour I'm gonna waste time. Like, so we can, must make sure we work with uh, employment agencies that employ people and say, hey, 
people gotta vote. This is an important part of their democracy. They must, they, they must be afforded that opportunity to vote without impacting their income. That's very important as well. That's some, these are some of the barriers that we face, uh, people experiencing homelessness face. We can please go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, also, there are barriers, not only when you get people registered, right? Once you overcome all those barriers of like, you know, getting information and access, and now it's to get there, right? Getting there is not that easy. As I said, barrier to casting a ballot comes into place as well. So registration, I said, is no current. They can be denied to vote. Elected officials are not, they are not, they are not understanding their own specific county or city laws. They can actually discourage people to vote. Uh, general dis, uh, uh, disengagement, people cannot be disengaged because of the historically, like, uh, we see our political people are giving up, like, you know, the process doesn't work for me, so why should I vote in the first place? But we kind of encourage people to vote and said, the only way that system changes is if we participate and make sure we make our voices known that we're not okay with this. And, you know, these are covid related things. Uh, sometimes when they, uh, in pre previously, when the agencies were closed because of COVID, you know, access to mailing was also a very limited, you know, limited polling location. So it's important when you're creating uh, your drive, you gotta remember to ensure that people are close to the locations. And if they're not close enough, you provide them transportation to get there because access is something that most of us don't think about. We can have a car, we can go to public transportation. Some people don't have even ID to get into those uh, resources as well. So that's something that you look out for when we are looking at registration. Uh, register people with lived experience or those experiencing homelessness on those who have no permanent addresses. It's very critical that we keep that in mind. Make sure we have equity in all the process that we are doing. Can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. And voter engagement tips, some of the way we can actually uh, ensure that uh, we are very inclusive uh, of people in the communities because not every person in the street speaks the same language. We gotta make sure that we are uh, multilingual, uh, like-minded. We include maybe Spanish, we include different languages that can actually inform people. And this is one of the things also, because remember, you don't need to speak English, to write in English to vote. Any language you can vote in that as well. And if you need people to help you translate, there can be people at the polling places to help you do that. So it's important that once we create materials, when we're creating materials for us, for, for informational purposes, as we're sharing with the clients and doing the intakes or in our organizations, we gotta be thinking about how uh, like America is a diverse place and make sure that even our resources is catered to people who we represent. It's very critical to have multilingual information, everything that we create. Uh, we can also help like educate newly, there are people who register new to voting. So like young people just turning 18, Sometimes the process are very new to them. So we gotta be patient with people and inform them about their right to vote and how the process works so that they are more encouraged to vote rather than seeing the process if it's tasking and it's a big deal. So it's very important to vote, but we gotta ensure people understand the processes and what their legal right it is they're allowed to vote. Uh, you can also hold a candidate forum, right? But also you gotta be mindful whenever you do uh, invite candidates, make sure you invite it on both parties. Make sure you, you don't uh, seem to be like you invite one political candidate or one party. That's actually against the regulation of, of city organizations. So whenever you send an invite, make sure you invite an open invitation to everybody from different party and political lines to come on to inform voters. The purpose of that is no more political, it's more about encouraging people to vote. And your purpose as a nonprofit is to encourage people to vote the, how they feel to like. You cannot force anybody to vote in a certain way because of, of, like, of your personal belief or any of the candidate that you bring on. And their job is to inform people the, the importance of voting. And that's very important to do that. Uh, you can also offer transportation to the point of, you know, like, you know, to the polling places where you can say, uh, we have this information. If you haven't registered yet, you can also register or like on the same day of election. And sometimes if you have, don't have uh, the registration on like prior, you can actually register on the day of, but sometimes you have to actually sign like a, like, like a document that actually uh, uh, like certified that. And some states require that a notary notarize your uh, voting, uh, like uh, vote, the, uh, the voting document as well. So it's very important to make sure you understand the locality, the laws of local, the city and the county you are in and the state you are in as well. So it's very important. So if you are a provider, if you're a non organization, organizations, you know that your client may not have access to those things like having the internet and access to those resources, make sure you become that resource person. You, you, you become that resource organization, provide them the necessary things they need to exercise the right to vote. Uh, the, the direction of the right to vote is very critical. And organization can volunteer organization as a polling place. Uh, you can also use your place as a nonprofit organization to raise people to vote. But just keep in mind that you cannot endorse any political party or a candidate. And if you are unsure of how you, as an organization you can do that, 
you can contact your uh, county election office or the board of uh, uh, the election in your state to actually they can actually help you with the process of how to get people registered and also to get them to the uh, to the polls in nonpartisan way you know like in a nonpartisan way in a way sure that people are well so thanks we can go to the next one Thank you. So the ways you can help, as I said, you can register people to vote. You can use your nonprofit organization as the address they can use in their forms when they are uh, they are applying. We gotta keep in mind that uh, whenever we are getting people to sign on to vote, uh, we cannot sign for them, and also we cannot use copies. We cannot send in copies of the uh, 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 the form. Someone can print something on the website, the official website, actually to use it as a voting place from the official. Uh, website of, of the county, but you cannot use photocopies. No, you cannot attach anything else to the forms to actually send that to uh, for voting. It must be purely signed by the person who's voting and registered to vote. So that's very critical. We can also uh, like we can organize drive, as I said. We can actually uh, get we can actually use some of the events happening in our communities to make sure that uh, whenever you know there's something happening in your community, you can actually use it that as a space where you can actually go there and say you can register people even in that place. So the more engagement there is, the more opportunity you have to raise people to vote and encourage people to do so. We can go next to the next slide, please. Thank you. And uh, you can do voter education. It's very critical to keeping uh, those without housing uh, like informed and engaged. That's what I'm talking about. If, like having information about voting, just make sure that information is not in particular endorsing of any particular party or a, or a candidate. And finally, we are here like encouraging everybody like to actually get people registered during the low income and uh, housing week where people can register to vote. I remember people can do vote, uh, they can do vote, uh, they can they can actually vote early and also they can vote on on election day. And even if you you can register to vote up until the election day as well. And some state is very different, so make sure you check with your city and county the uh, deadline for when you can vote and and the last day you can register as well. Okay, please go next. Thank you very much. So uh, to do that, the first step to successful drive is that develop a plan. Uh, that means maybe you uh, uh, have one person leading up the drive and that person can be the coordinator of coordinating everything. That's to do with transportation, if it's to do with registration forms being printed out ready for people or having the internet ready and the process is ready for people to register online. Just make sure you have a person who's taking lead on that. And so delegate responsibility so that there's no like uh, people don't know what to do and how to do the drive. So it's very critical that you have a plan to do so. You can go next, please. Thank you very much. Uh, you can prepare now. You gotta publicize your information because uh, you know creating a, a plan is very important. But also you gotta make sure people understand, know about what the drive is happening, what location, where it's happening, which day, uh, like uh, like like what time is happening as well. And if you need to get people to get there today, it's like, like it's also very important. So make sure you publicize your events so people know about where they can actually come and register to vote. We can please go next. Thank you. And then you can conduct you can conduct uh, conduct the drive as well. So now this is the place where you actually do the drive itself. And if you are not sure about the legality of how to do that, please you can also consult your county uh, like the election board. Just make sure you know uh, the guidelines within there. Whenever you're doing drives, make sure you have no any resources that is endorsing of a candidate in a particular way. And the voters are purely vote, uh, registering best and on their own free will, not uh, being tailored. The, the uh, clients or people experiencing homelessness are working with you feel any pressure to uh, register in any particular party if you're helping them register. So make sure that's uh, purely their own choice and that's it, they are signing the document themselves. Okay, please go next. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the important part is to get out to vote. So once people register, please uh, make sure you have transportation already if it's far away. And make sure you encourage people to vote, have information that they can use. And if there are, there's language to barriers, make sure you uh, provide, you let them know that they have a right to make sure people are uh, at the polling place, you know, provide them resources and also opportunity to translate and also help them in that capacity. So. That's why, please, uh, it's important that we encourage people to vote. I know it's challenging sometimes to when people are being moved from one place to the next, but it's important that we engage voters because they're the most important voice to have when they, is, is, they are most affected by the issues that are happening regarding homelessness. Please, thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, these are just some of the questions. Yes, a city organization, you're allowed to engage voters. You can do so as well. This document will be shared with you after this discussion, so you can have uh, all this uh, more in details. We also have a full uh, uh, research that we did you can look at as well. So there are resources there you can access to. You can also use the QR code to access our, our voting manual. You can actually use this for training for your own organization and other people. So yeah, that's what you can do. But we believe that our voting is a very critical part of democracy. And I hope you engage your people you're working with in the community to vote. And it's very important. Every vote matters. Thanks. All right, thank you, Francis. Uh, we're moving over to Lauren. Great, thank you, Francis. So hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Kunis. I'm the executive director at Vote Writers. And at Vote Writers, we focus on the crucial issue of voter ID. So it's actually perfect timing that I came right after Francis, who gave us such great information about voter registration. In 38 states with voter ID laws, just registering is actually not enough. So we're very excited to be working as hard as we can over the next 70 something days and beyond um, to make sure that we get people registered and get them the right ID they need to vote and do so much more. Um, so as you see on this slide, Vote Writers is the country's leading organization focused on the issue of ID. Uh, we have been at this work since 2012 and our work has never been more needed than it is today as we see a wave of restrictive ID laws sweeping across the country that I'll go into depth on later. Um, but I was particularly excited to receive this invitation to speak with you all today um, because Vote Writers really prioritizes and centers in our work the Americans who are most harmed by voter ID laws. And we know that unhoused individuals are particularly vulnerable to this type of voter suppression law. We can move to the next slide, please. So at Vote Writers, we have three main buckets of programming. The first is voter education. Um, we do lots of outreach work in communities and online to make sure that every voter in America knows what ID they need to register and then knows what ID then they need to vote in person or by mail. We also provide voter ID assistance. So this is free one-on-one -on -one help to any eligible voter who needs support in getting an ID. So this can be anything from uh, ordering a birth certificate for them online and paying for it, uh, getting an updated social security card, paying for uh, a new driver's license, getting transportation to the ID issuing office, name change, and so much more. We wanna make sure that any logistical, financial, or legal barrier that folks face in getting an ID is removed and they're able to vote as a result. And last but not least, we do lots of communications and digital work to make sure that we're meeting voters where they are, which is increasingly online um, and getting the word out about ID laws so that they present as minimal of a barrier to the ballot box as possible for the tens of millions of Americans that we know are affected. Uh, so Vote Writers is a national organization. This year we have staff on the ground in the eight states on the slide here. Um, these are states that have tight margins in elections in November um, and that also have very restrictive ID laws on the books. Six of these states have actually passed stricter ID laws since 2020 alone. So lots of work to do on the ground there, but I do wanna stress that we are a national organization with virtual help and national resources available for all 50 states and DC. If you can go to the next slide, please. So I often say that at Vote Writers, we punch way above our weight due to the extent that we work with so many different partners across sectors and across the country. Um, this slide has actually been updated since we last uh, did our partner count, but since 2012, we've worked with almost 2,000 partners and 10,000 volunteers to punch above our weight and reach millions of voters. Partners like nonprofit partners who have unique and trusted reach and existing touch points with communities that are most vulnerable to ID laws are really essential um, partners for us in this work. We do everything we can to work on site and to meet voters where they are through existing services that they're already accessing and making sure that our ID help is available to one and all. 
Moving to the next slide, I thought it would be helpful to do just a little bit of a primer on what the lay of the land is when it comes to voter ID laws in 2024. On the next slide, we have a color-coded map that shows the 38 states that have voter ID laws in place. Um, so in these states, simply registering to vote might not be enough. You also have to show a specific form of ID to cast a ballot that counts. So again, ID to register, the bar is often much lower. You can put in the last four digits of your social security number, for example. Um, but then in many of these states, to then successfully cast a ballot, you need to clear a higher bar and have an updated state license, for example. Um, so the 38 states that are colored in here have voter ID laws in place. This is more than ever before in our country's history. And the 18 states in the orangey salmon color have have passed new or stricter ID laws since 2020 alone. And these impact voter registration, ID requirements, in-person ID requirements, and also requirements for voting by mail. If we can go to the next law slide, a lot of people say to me sometimes, so what? Like we have lots of voter ID laws in place, but doesn't everyone have an ID? The answer is absolutely not. We were really excited to partner with the Brennan Center for Justice and the University of Maryland uh, to release just a few months ago results from the first national study in who lacks ID in America in almost 20 years. Um, and we found that 34.5 million voting age citizens or about 15% of voting age Americans uh, don't have an unexpired government issued photo ID, like a driver's license or a state ID card that has their current name and address on it and may run into problems at the polls as a result. If we go to the next slide, um, we found unsurprisingly uh, that that 14.8% figure did not cut across all segments of the electorate equally. Um, so they, we found that communities of color and young people were among the most likely to lack a current form of ID. And importantly for this audience, we also, again, unsurprisingly, found that unhoused and low-income Americans were far more likely to lack the form of ID that they need to vote and also do so much more when it comes to living a full and prosperous life. If we can go to the next slide. For us at Vote Riders, um, this was almost good news. So we found that when we asked people why they did not have a driver's license, almost one in five of them, 19%, identified solvable problems and barriers such as the cost of getting a license or not being able to get to the ID issuing office because it was far away and not accessible on public transport, um, unpaid fines, for example, lack of time, lack of underlying documents like a birth certificate. Um, so these for us at Vote Riders are problems that we are set up to solve and set up to solve at scale. Um, so for us, while we were, um, you know, of course, upset to see that such a large percentage of Americans lack the ID that they increasingly need to vote in the United States, we also were heartened to see um, that we could make a real difference in addressing these barriers before Election Day and beyond. Moving to the next slide, voter confusion is also a really important thing to up uplift when we're talking about ID laws. Uh, we found that two out of every 10 Americans living in states with strict photo ID laws didn't know or weren't sure that they would need to bring that form of ID to the polls. So when we think about the impact of voter ID laws, we know they are directly disenfranchising tens of millions of Americans. But what this statistic speaks to is that they're also indirectly disenfranchising even more Americans because of confusion, because of misinformation, and it makes our voter education work that much more crucial uh, in terms of clearing up the confusion and helping people navigate. Moving on to the next slide. That was the bad news portion of the presentation. We're now going to the good news. Um, there is a lot that you can do about this voter ID crisis. There's a lot that we can do together. 
Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to make sure that folks were aware of our website. If you go to votewriters.org, uh, we have an interactive map for all 50 states in DC available in English and Spanish uh, that lets you look up the current voter ID requirements in your state for both voting in person and by mail. We have the full and comprehensive list of the IDs you need to bring to vote and also guidance on if you don't have that type of ID, what can you do to cast a ballot? In some states you can vote provisionally and they'll do a signature match. In other states you can sign a affidavit form attesting to your identity and you can cast a regular ballot. It all depends on your state. It can get confusing, that's why we are here to help. If you go to the next slide, this is a QR code that you can quickly bookmark, make a plan to share this link widely with the audiences that you are reaching out to in the coming months, but also beyond, uh, to make sure that people know what the current requirements are in their state when it comes to voter ID, um, and making sure that their plan to vote includes bringing the right form of ID to the polls or using the right identifying information when they're casting a mail-in ballot. On the next slide, I wanted to update uh, to make sure that I also flagged for everyone's attention some of the specific community landing pages that we have. I alluded to this fact earlier, but we know very clearly um, that voter ID laws harm some communities more than others. So our website has dedicated landing pages for some of those voting communities that are most likely to face ID challenges. So this includes students, this includes trans and non-binary individuals, people with disabilities and more. We also have a blog post on the very thorny but uh, solvable challenges related to voting while unhoused. Um, and that link there will take you to a blog on sort of how-to guidance for the ID you need to register, the ID you need to vote, and how being unhoused intersects with both of those um, steps of the voting process. On the next slide, is a description of our most popular uh, voter education and voter assistance product, which is our voter ID information cards. Vote Writers has um, wallet-sized cards for all 50 states and DC in English and Spanish um, that are great things to pass out at points of entry for, um, you know, a food bank or a shelter or at a community voter registration drive. Um, they're a great way to highlight the difference between getting registered and then making sure you have the ID you need to vote. Um, any nonpartisan, nonprofit organization can order these cards for their state in unlimited quantities on our website and have them shipped directly to you for all of your get out the vote work this year. Uh, the link is on our next on the next slide. It's votewriters.org slash cards. Uh, these cards are also great. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is an example of it um, in terms of what's on it. So the front is sort of the key takeaway when it comes to voter ID in your state. The middle of the cards, they're foldable, uh, lists all of the different options you can bring to the polls to cast a ballot and also gives some guidance on what to do if you don't have that. Um, and on the back, you see that if you find you're reading the card and you say, I don't have any of these forms of ID, um, we offer the contact information for vote writers so uh, eligible voters can be in touch with us and start getting on the process of one-on-one -on -one free help to get the ID they need to vote. So on the next slide now, you will see uh, the actual uh, guidance for how to get cards. And then if you go to the next slide, you will see the QR code. So really encourage folks, it takes 30 to 60 seconds to place the order for these cards. No strings attached, they come straight to you for your state in English and Spanish. Um, and they're really a valuable way to make sure that you're doing your part to get voter ID information out into the community where you're working and also connecting people who need free ID help directly to vote writers. On the next slide, I wanted to break down a little bit our voter ID assistance work. Um, before we started this webinar, I was talking to some of the other panelists about our work, um, and I often refer to our ID assistance as almost like a Trojan horse, if you will. Um, because when you come to 
organizations that are doing work with very vulnerable and mar marginalized populations experiencing crisis in many places, um, like food banks and shelters and uh, community resource centers. When we say we want to register voters, a lot of times people are going to walk away and people are saying this is not a priority for us. But as vote writers, when we come in and say we want to help you get an ID, um, a lot of times that gets people's ears perked up because we know, and I'm sure all of you on this call know as well, that getting an ID opens up pathways to so much more. Um, for many of the voters we assist, the ID we help them obtain opens up the ability to access more stable housing for their family, to access a job in the formal sector, to open a bank account, and it lets them vote. Um, so we know, we are no stranger to the fact that getting an ID costs money. It can take a lot of time. It can take weeks or months to get ID. But at Vote Writers, we are really proud through our team of 30, but also our thousands of volunteers uh, to be standing alongside thousands of Americans every year and helping them get this life-changing document. Uh, we cover the costs of vital documents. We, I should actually, not to steal uh, Celia's thunder, but we provide transportation to ID issuing offices completely for free. Thanks to a generous uh, grant of rideshare credits from Lyft this year. Um, and we also provide any pro bono legal assistance for things like new birth certificates or name changes when needed. Um, this is a really unique service we provide. Uh, we're doing it with voters who are oftentimes left out of voter engagement that's led by parties and campaigns, but they because they don't have a voting history or track record. But it's a really important segment of the electorate. And we're really proud of the way that our work in this area touches on civic engagement, but also social and racial justice and equity. If you would like to refer, if you go to the next slide, uh, voters to vote writers for free ID help, there are a couple ways you can do that. Um, we have a helpline number that you can call or text. It's 866-ID-TO-VOTE. You can also enter information via the free help form on our website. Um, and also, if you order the voter ID info cards I spoke about earlier, anyone who sees that will see this contact information and be able to reach out to us directly for ID help. Lastly, if you move on to the next slide, um, our team does lots of trainings. Our goal is to make sure that the entire voter engagement sector um, is thinking and talking about voter ID and making sure it's part of everyone's plan to vote, knowing what a crucial part of that plan it is. So we do lots of national trainings like this one, state-specific trainings. We train canvassers and social workers, anyone and everyone, to help them understand ID laws in their state um, and know how to refer voters who need free help to vote writers. On the last slide, um, before sharing contact information, I just wanted to, you know, as you can tell from the survey data, we love numbers at Vote Writers. We're really focused on sort of tracking our impact and understanding the scope and scale of the problem. But at the end of the day, uh, the stories of the individuals that we assist are really what keep us going and keep us motivated to do this important work. If you go to our website, um, we really try and sort of capture and amplify these stories so that there's broader understanding of the very powerful barriers to voting and economic justice and opportunity that ID access places in front of community members, friends, family, neighbors, and more. Um, you'll also see lots of stories of unhoused individuals um, that we have helped to get an ID and get back on their feet and hope you all can be our partners in helping us collect even more of those stories and reach more folks. Um, so some ways to get in touch with us, follow us across social platforms at Boat Riders. Uh, if you are interested in partnering with Boat Riders, please visit our website. Also, our email address is info at boatriders.org. Uh, thank you for all you're doing and hope to be in touch with you soon. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you, Lauren. And Celia, yeah, you're up. Hi, Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Celia. Um, I'm here to talk about Lift Up and our transportation access programs. Next slide, please. So um, on the team, I manage all of our um, social impact work. Um, this is our strategy for how we think about our social impact work at Lyft. Uh, the first 
main thing that we do is that we are always thinking about how we use our core superpower transportation to drive impact. And so we do that by being able to connect communities with each other, um, create meaningful positive impact. And then the second piece of it is to ensure that our programs and initiative drive positive RI for the business in all the different ways that that, that, that can be interpreted as. Next slide, please. So what is LiftUp? So this is a little bit interesting um, because LiftUp is not necessarily a program name, but it's more of our branding framework. So it's how we think about um, all of our social impact programs are nested under LiftUp. It's essentially our comprehensive effort to expand transportation access to those who need it most. And we do this by partnering with leading nonprofits to provide free and discounted rides to individuals and families who lack affordable, reliable transportation. Next slide. So this year, our 2024 Lift Up programs uh, are essentially um, on the screen here, but we're really focused this year on food access, jobs access, supporting the refugee community, disaster response, voting access, and round up and donate. And so the, for the purposes of this call, I am going to primarily focus on our voting access work as that is where the majority of our resources are going to. It is an election year. It's a big part of the work that we do. Um, and so I'm gonna quickly go into that um, a little bit more, but I just wanted to give you all a quick snapshot in terms of the work that we're doing here at Lyft this year. Next slide. So the way LiftUp works is that we essentially think of it as like three different stakeholders. The first is our nonprofit partners who we work with to identify the individuals and families that need support. And they're the critical resource that we partner with to make sure that communities are being serviced. Uh, drivers are important to this work because they help connect the individuals to the critical services that they need. Drivers also receive 100% of any lift up ride. So any donation that we give to nonprofit partners, drivers get paid in full. Uh, riders are also a key part of this because they participate in our Roundup and Donate program, which essentially allows them to donate their donate their change to the nonprofit of their choice. And the nonprofits are listed in our app. And so a, a writer would go into the app, select uh, a nonprofit partner, and then their change will just get donated um, indefinitely until they turn that feature off. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, I'm here to talk about our voting access work. So I'll go into that a bit deeper. Next slide. So <clears throat> the reason why we did this program is for a lot of various stats that have come out just around how transportation access is really important to this but especially with voting. So we were able to pull a stat uh, that was actually done through research um, at a university that essentially stated that 36% voted versus 66 with car access, which resulted in a 30 percentage point, percentage point gap. And so we essentially were thinking about, well, we're a transportation company, how do we you know, figure this out? And so we did it through our voting access work. So we do this to eliminate um, the, this barrier by providing discounted and free rides for federal elections. Next slide, please. Just some cute graphics that we have. Next slide, please. So the way we think about our uh, program is that we have a three-pronged strategy. The first is that we want to make sure everybody can get to the polls. And we do this um, by providing a direct-to-consumer ride code on election day. This is essentially our nationwide discount. Everybody can access this. It'll become live closer to election day. Our second goal is by supporting individuals who traditionally face barriers. And we do this by partnering with nonprofit partners and providing them with higher value discount codes to make sure that their community members are able to access um, the polls without any additional barriers. And so um, as vote writers mentioned, they're one of the partners that we work with to support um, in part of this goal. And the third goal is to encourage our clients and any of our partners to participate by either creating their own campaigns or by donating to our nonprofit partners to make sure that everybody gets to, to the polls on election day. Next slide, please. 
And so this year, our program is unique in that we have pledged to grow the program by 25%. Uh, we're still offering discounted ride codes to the polls on election day. We're donating free and heavily discounted rides to nonprofit partners. And we're also partnering with Levi's and MTV to form a new coalition that's aimed at closing the voting gap for community college students. So traditionally, we've sort of broadened the scope and this year we're working um, specifically with uh, this coalition to support 500,000 new community college students by 2028. Next slide, please. Here is just a short list of our partners. We have a lot more. As I mentioned, we're working with over 20 nonprofit partners. We're still uh, bringing in some corporate partners, um, but this is just a rough snapshot of some of the um, organizations that we've locked in this year. Next slide, please. And so how can you get involved? And so this is interesting because um, this is a really great opportunity for you to get the word out to the communities that we are offering this ride code. So we just want to make sure that on election day that everybody who needs a ride can, uh, you know, um, obtain it. And so um, once our discount code is live, our call to action is just to make sure that you share that far and wide and that you get it into the hands of as many people as possible. Next slide, please. I think that's it. Great. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Celia, thank you for your presentation. Uh, can I have uh, all of our uh, panelists uh, on camera and uh, unmuted for this portion? Uh, uh, so to open up, we do have a question from Andrea. I believe this is specific to Lauren uh, regarding a point of contact for more state specific assistance. Uh, Andrea is based in Georgia, and I assume this is referring to uh, assistance with ID. Yeah, sure. That would be great. Um, I'm happy to drop my email in the chat. Um, it's just lauren at votewriters.org. Uh, oh, that only went to organizers. Um, um, sorry. Anywho, if you uh, email me at lauren at votewriters.org um, or email our info at votewriters.org um, and requesting to be in touch with me, I can connect you to our team in Georgia on the ground. We have staff in the Atlanta metro area as well as Columbus um, and a really active team of volunteers who would be excited to talk more about how we could work together. Uh, so David, uh, well, we actually put the um, uh, Lauren's email in the chat. So uh, for those who are interested in reaching out, uh, feel free to uh, save that contact information. We'll also share uh, anything that was shared from these presentations in a one pager. So, um, you know, once the presentations end, we'll send out an email with all the wonderful documents um, uh, that our presenters want to share to uh, you all. Uh, any audience questions, feel free to type them in the questions chat. Uh, question for uh, Francis. Um, you know, you guys do a lot of uh, outreach on the ground. I'm curious to know, like, uh, thinking of other voting alternatives that don't require uh, folks to get to the polls, things like uh, absentee ballots. Uh, do you guys have any, like, initiative to help promote that as well? And what are the some of the barriers with absentee ballots and, and on this page? Yeah, for sure. Thanks uh, for the question. Uh, absentee ballots, you know, uh, the barrier is always, you know, the address situation where they don't have an address, you know, being displaced, moving from place to place is hard to keep the information current. And having a place where they can use as an address to send out the absentee ballot is very critical. And sometimes people can move out of state, right? People can actually move out of state. But if they actually register in that specific state, they can still use that uh, for, uh, for voting purposes, they can use that precinct. One of the things that we are doing actually this year is a partnership with uh, TGC, 
which is Transform Transformative Justice Coalition for the Homeless, uh, Transformative Justice Coalition. They focus on uh, young people voting, you know, people of college, people are just young into the process. They, they educate people about voting, right? So this year we are partnering with them uh, to go on a national tour to 11 to 12 states across the country in battleground states, focusing on voter engagement and also uh, like the registration as well. So we know the barrier is not just to get people to the uh, to register because of lack of addresses and places. So we are working in partnership with local organizations who have places they can use their places as a place uh, like as an address to vote. But also we're making sure like transportation as uh, the share earlier lift, you know, the idea of lift and the uh, uh, the voter IDs. Those are good resources to have. If we like in partnership with those uh, like like in partnership with those organizations, we can actually do do much more to get people to the vote. You know, the lift uh, program is amazing. And we're also providing transportation there, like uh, like on the road as well too. So we are working not only to get people to vote, but also make sure that people have access. And also those IDs, having those are very critical because as uh, as, uh, as Laura mentioned, ID says more than just for voting purposes and it's very critical. And uh, we'll be connecting soon with that regarding how we can partner with that as well. So partnership in this work is very critical, ensuring that we uh, connect people to resources that they may not know about in the communities. And that's how we're able to do with our programs well, we have uh, we have field offices, for example. Uh, we have Mary, who is on the call today. She's in California. We have field offices in various states, and we use our field offices to actually help us with our local activities, specifically to the community we are looking to work with. Right on, uh, Celia. A quick question for you uh, is from Gloria. Um, does Lyft cover Oregon coast? Uh, Gloria is in rural Oregon, and they have. Uh, they tend to be left out on a lot of things, uh, yet they have a high percentage of homeless veterans. Is Lyft involved anywhere along the Oregon coast? So Lyft is actually, <clears throat> our program is nationwide. And so all of the organizations we work with have a national footprint. And so um, we can definitely look into uh, what our supply looks like in rural Oregon, but it's definitely an area that um, we should have coverage in. But if we, if we need to double click on that particular community, we can definitely double check. And another question for you, Celia, uh, regarding when the Lyft code will be released. That's a great question. <laughs> so we are looking at um, early October. Uh, hopefully details will come out sooner, but uh, folks should start to see sort of some of our marketing efforts push behind the ride code. Um, riders will begin to receive a push notification, drivers will receive messages, and then we'll begin to push out the word on all of our social media about the ride code um, sometime in October, potentially early October. All right, right on. Uh, so we're running a little low on time for Q&A, but I want to give this opportunity for our three panelists to share any final thoughts or comments uh, before we close out today. I'll say just thanks for everything you're doing. I feel like it's so important to not just focus on bigger turnout numbers, but focusing on building an electorate that is more equitable, more diverse, um, that includes some of the most marginalized voices in our society. Um, so love to see nonprofits who might not focus on voting day in and day out, like some of us do, think about how they can use their footprint to make a really big imp impact in service of democracy this year and also encourage folks to think also beyond election day um, because this is a long-term long-term uh, long effort and it's important to be integrating these types of reminders all the time but especially before big elections like this one Yeah, thanks so much and great point for sure. I actually second that. I think partnership is also very important to ensure that we continue to uh, collaborate with our resources because as I said, TJC, the partnership is very critical. Why? Because individually as, a, as an organization, we can do so less by United, we can do so much. And homelessness is something that is solvable if we actually put our mind to it. So unity within our movement is very important that we say enough is enough. Uh, we can actually hand homelessness if we choose to. In the system, systematic barriers have been put in place to defend just people from not having housing now, from ID uh, regulation that prevent from voting. And there are systems that allow people to vote, but we've got to be much stronger as a united force and said, uh, we have, we have, we have, uh, we've been asking for too long. We've got to start demanding, and that demand has to be unified, not uh, broken apart. We've got to be, we got to get away from our silos as, as non-profit organization, as people providing services. 
and come as one and said, what do we really want to do? And how can we end homelessness? And we can do that if we choose to do so. And uh, I'm looking forward to partnering with Lorraine and uh, their work and also especially with your work, because I think all of them complement each other. Uh, we all can actually do so much more together. Thank you for having me here and thanks for those who came to join us to listen. Yeah, I just want to echo what all of my, um, you know, co-panelists have mentioned on this call. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that we're focusing on, you know, a subset of, you know, community and folks that don't normally get this type of support. And so um, I'm very grateful to be here, very grateful to speak with all of you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, and thank you three for being on and thank you to all of our attendees. Um, like I said earlier, follow up with uh, recording and presentation slides will come to your email in the next 24 hours um also want to give a shout out to or promotion for our podcast coming up soon um that will release on uh, september 19th so be there spotify apple podcasts um also we have our next webinar in september the dates will come for that and that'll be on amplifying personal stories on uh, amplifying personal stories of homeless veterans. So look forward to seeing you guys all for the next things that we have coming. Uh, and again, thank you. Bye everybody.